Hello. Today I am apparently possessed because I was setting up to film an introduction for the video on the role of the sea and water in Irish folklore, but instead I appear to be filming Folklore 101. What is folklore? So let's engage in that. There's There's a misconception that all stories were written with the intention of teaching about cultural values, social values, even basic safety to children. Uh, this conception is false. It was, it, it can largely be traced back to the Brothers Grimm, uh, who were disappointed with the lack of success in the first edition of their book, and so they completely reframed it in the idea that it was for the education of children uh, and it's basically a marketing gimmick that has just stuck around and people haven't completely dismissed yet if you don't believe me i want you to try something i want you to try writing in the comments right now a story that has absolutely no indicators about your culture or the society you live in. That may seem challenging but doable at first, but let me clarify what that would actually mean. You can't describe your characters. Even if you only have one character, you can't describe that person. You can't describe their clothing. You can't describe what their clothing is made of. You can't even describe whether or not they have clothing. You can't describe whether or not they have a home, and even if you could, you wouldn't be able to describe what that home looked like, what it was made of. You can't describe any geographical features. You can't talk about the weather. You can't talk about any local flora or fauna. You can't talk about any tools or implements or furniture or toys your characters may have, any possessions at all. You can't talk about gender. You can't talk about race. You can't talk about death. You can't talk about songs. You can't talk about other stories. You can't talk about music in general. You can't talk about any beliefs. You can't talk about anyone's relationship with each other. You can't use any pronouns. You can't write in any language or dialect that would, would indicate where you live, what time period you live in, or your position in society. If that now sounds impossible, if it sounds impossible to write a story without including any of that, and honestly a great, other great deal of other things that I've missed, then you see my point. It's impossible to write a story that does not indicate any information. It is impossible to write a story that does not teach in some way. Stories don't necessarily teach because they were formulated with the intention of teaching. Stories teach because they're stories. That is our first lesson and it's also the point of studying folklore. A folklore obviously isn't just stories or maybe that's not so obvious. A lot of people seem to think it is. Folklore is the totality of all knowledge and information that is primarily passed down through oral tradition. So if in think about our own culture, our own culture today, most jokes would be passed down orally. Dad jokes would be passed down orally. If your mother teaches you to cook, that's been passed down orally. 
if you learn martial arts, that's passed down orally. Anything passed down orally is oral tradition, and anything that's oral tradition is folklore. Now we look at cultures that didn't have a written tradition. Ireland, for a long time, didn't really have much of a written tradition. Writing was mostly for the priests. It was mostly for small bits of communication. It wasn't really for teaching. And so uh, you would have architecture, how to build a house, uh, how to make a musical instrument, how to build a boat. Those things all would have been passed down orally. And so they all would have been folklore. Uh, there are two pitfalls. People who did not study folklore academically as its own individual subject tend to fall into. And I call these the media pitfall and the history pitfall. The media pitfall is basically the people who studied film, uh, literature, theater, creative writing, English, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it's the pitfall they tend to fall into, and it's honestly the more dangerous one. Um, uh, the ideology, the, the ideas about folklore that are taught in that field are largely based on the methodology of the Brothers Grimm, on people inspired by them. Uh, it follows on the ideas of Joseph Campbell, a lot of um, or Carl Jung as well. And the reason I say those ideas are dangerous is the Brothers Grimm were hyper-nationalist. Joseph Campbell um, is a mysticist, or was a mysticist, and was... I believe he was rumoured to be an anti-Semite, but his ideas, including the, the hero's journey, and perhaps especially the hero's journey, have a lot of racist underpinnings to them, and... There's a lot of racist underpinnings in how he created the, those ideas. He oversimplifies cultures and cultural beliefs and cultural stories. In order to make his idea of the monomyth, the one singular story that everyone is always telling, work, he had to flatten the stories of other cultures. He had to flatten the traditions of other cultures to force them to fit into the mold he was making. And to force them to fit into a primarily Western European mold. He had to alter other cultures to fit European cultures in order to make his ideas work. That is harmful, clearly. The Brothers Grimm, as I said, they were hyper-nationalist. They often distorted things to follow in their nation nationalist ideals and they built a lot of their methodology around enforcing those nationalist ideals. A lot of the lessons, lessons taught in their stories are ones they inserted because they wanted to instill proper German behaviour in the people who would read them. And this is why they were so well beloved by the Nazis. And it is why they were so well used by the Hitler Youth. So that is dangerous. That viewpoint on a perspective on teaching folklore. It is dangerous socially and culturally. And as well as that, those ideas are massively outdated. They're not really taught in folklore anymore. There, I have a big problem with the media field. Um, I, I have a very large problem with it. When it borrows from other disciplines, it does so badly and does not update the information. Nowhere near regularly enough. The other pitfall, the history pitfall, is approaching folklore from the perspective of a historian or an archaeologist. In those fields, you want more concrete facts. You want specific narratives taught, and you don't want those narratives changed 
unless there is very, very good reason for doing so, unless there is very legitimate sources backing that up. And that is good. In history, in archaeology, that is good. It is how we prevent things like Holocaust denial taking over. It's how we prevent things like um, the erasure of colonialism. Um, now, of course, it is also used in the other direction, but it's hard to get around that. You do need to keep some control over how the narratives are explained, and of course that can be exploited by bad people when they get into power. It's hard to reconcile. A people who are approaching folklore from the field of history or archaeology tend to engage with it as if it were an aspect of history. And that's not really the right approach. It only superficially resembles history. It only looks like history kind of on the surface. It is far more closely related to the field of linguistics. In the same way that linguistics studies the development of how language works, the development of how language changes and grows, and what the cultural and social influences on those changes are and have been. Folklore does the same thing with the oral tradition. And in the same way that linguistics will watch language change in the present and talk about and postulate and make observations on what the social influences and cultural influences on what those changes might be, the study of folklore does the same thing with the oral tradition. We watch the changes as they happen and we talk about what may be causing them. And just as linguistics has very rarely attempted to create any kind of control on that development, has very rarely tried to influence that development, Folklorists don't really attempt to influence the development of folklore. We don't really try to prevent it going in certain directions. We don't really try to prevent it changing. And the reason for that in both cases is that history is a series of established facts. And while our understanding of those facts and our evidence for those facts may change, the facts themselves are fairly solid and immutable. However, folklore and linguistics, the oral tradition and language, they are inherently changeable. And that is part of their life cycle. The, literally, the definition of folklore involves it being variable and changeable. Those are two of its primary char characteristics. And if you stop either language or folklore from changing, from developing, from going in new directions, you've killed it. You've stopped it. That is now a dead language. And in the case of folklore, that is now literature. It's no longer folklore. You can't calcify folklore, you can't crystallize it, you can't mummify it, and have it still be folklore. Folklore is communal, and it is democratic. What the majority of people say the folklore of their time is, is what the folklore of their time is. Just like, just like with language. How the majority of people are using the language in that time is the correct version of the language in that time. Hey, uh, I'm editing at the moment and I just want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, I mean the majority of people within the culture whose folklore is in question. Second of all, while we do look into the past in folklore, we're not looking for more authentic versions because that's not a thing. We're looking for changes, and we're looking for where that change came from. Change is the point of this field. 
Well, antiquity does not equal authenticity. The older stuff is not more authentic than the newer stuff. It's just not. Now, there are times when folklorists do need to step in. If someone has, say, made a change to the folklore, if they are presenting the folklore in a new light, if they are uh, talking about a change that has occurred recently in the folklore, but are presenting it in such a way that they're indicating that the folklore has always been that way, that is when folklorists need to step in. And that is when we need to make objections. And really, this study, this study of a culture's folklore should primarily be done and led by members of the culture whose tradition is being studied. Anything else is leaning in towards colonialism. Now, this idea that existed for a long time, that only people from outside a culture can objectively uh, study it, is nonsense. Only people from within the culture have enough of a cultural context, enough of a cultural experience to accurately read it, to accurately parse it, and to accurately express it. And more than that, more than that, they are more likely to be trusted by the people they are talking to and engaging with. What I do on this channel, and what most people think of when they think of folklore research is actually just the shallow end of folklore research. It is reading about the documentation that other people have done in the past, analyzing that and examining it and again looking for the cultural and social influences. But as I say that's the shallow end. That's the easy stuff. It's the most accessible thing. It's really just building on the work that other people have done in the past. The harder and more vital and more important part of the work of a folklorist is studying and collecting the folklore that is happening now. Contemporary folklore. It is about going out, doing fieldwork gathering information, seeing how these stories and traditions have been changing, and looking into why they have been changing. That is the more serious work of the folklorist, the more vital, more important work of the folklorist, the deep work. And it's a little bit less accessible. It requires a lot of travel. It requires talking to a lot of people. It requires a lot of funding. I'd love to engage with it more, but I don't have an awful lot of money or free time. <laughs> um, if I did have more money and free time, I'd be happy to do more of it and to report on it here. But if you are going to study folklore, you need to think about it like a folklorist. You can't think about it like a historian, you can't think about it like a filmmaker or a game designer or someone with a media degree. <laughs> you have to think about it like a folklorist. You have to think about it in terms of documenting cultural change and growth. You have to think about it in terms of societal shifts, of changes in belief and changes in values and how they influence the stories we tell how they influence the traditions we maintain, what traditions we leave behind, how we alter our traditions. That is the study of folklore. It is not about pure documentation. It is not about enforcement of beliefs or enforcement of story types. It is about documentation and analysis and understanding our cultural perspective. Now, if you enjoyed this, please leave a like, please make a comment, please share it around. If enough people watch it and like it, I might make more of these. I might talk more about how folklore works. I think my next one would probably about be about 
uh, how the influence of the internet has accelerated folklore development quite dramatically and what constitutes modern folklore. If you enjoyed it, please let me know. Now maybe I'll film what I actually came to film.